Thank you very much. Um, I think given the fact that Rainey Dastin and I are close friends, it will not be surprising that my talk in many ways is a response to hers, although I had not heard what she was going to write until I heard her speak it today. <clears throat> so an embroidered cloth, the color of dark blood, is threaded throughout the Aristaya. I want to track the references to this cloth in the order that they appear in the trilogy, noting in particular the way that different characters in the plays claim credit for the cloth or are blamed for it. We first encounter the red cloth in the Agamemnon when Agamemnon protests against stepping on the rich fabric that Clytemnestra has spread before him. Perhaps the origin of our saying of putting out the red carpet to welcome a guest. He says to her, do not strew my path with garments. And he speaks of subtly woven beauties, embroideries, the tapestry, these lovely cloths, these weavings so dear in price. The very last words we ever hear him speak are treading on purple. Clytemnestra persuades him by speaking of an abundance of purple for the dyeing of garments and the treading of many garments. But it's Cassandra who's the first to speak of the sinister aspect of the red cloth. When she predicts, speaking of Clytemnestra and Agamemnon, she will take him in the folds of the robe. And so after the deed is done, Clytemnestra says, I threw about him an encompassing net, an evil wealth of cloak. Aegisthus credits not Clytemnestra, but the Furies with the use of the red cloth when he says, now I take pleasure to have seen this man lying here in the robes that were the nets of the Furies for him. But then he adds another agent himself when he tells the story, beginning with Thyestes' feast and concludes, and I am the one who stitched together Agamemnon's murder. Clytemnestra, Aegisthus, and the Furies are connected to the murderous red cloth and to the vengeance that it signifies in very different ways. In the libation bearers, the agency of the cloth reverts primarily to Clytemnestra. Orestes speaks of his father killed in the folds and coils of the deadly viper. Electra says, remember the robes put to new use as a net. The chorus, speaking of Clytemnestra's dream that she gave birth to a snake, says she wrapped the snake in swaddling clothes like a baby, just as she wrapped Agamemnon in the red robe. But when the nurse speaks of Orestes being swaddled, the equation suggests Clytemnestra's equally murderous plans for Orestes. But once again, the blame shifts to Aegisthus. Orestes lifts an imaginary robe and says, look at the trap for my poor father, the tyings of his feet. Um, there we go, I, something happened to the screen there. The tyings of his feet, the fetters of his hands. This was the covering of the man. This robe is my witness that the sword of Aegisthus has spoiled the many other dyes in the embroidery. You I address you woven cloth that murdered my father. The phrase, the many other dyes in the embroidery, suggests that the blood from other murders stretching back into the dim past stained the cloth that was the instrument of this most recent bloodshed on the embroidery. In the Eumenides, the Furies say of Orestes, he slipped from the net. And Orestes says of Agamemnon, my mother killed him with cunning nets, returning the agency to Clytemnestra. Apollo finally cites the red cloth as evidence of the part played by Clytemnestra in the murder of Agamemnon. As he went through his bath, she enfolded him at the end with a robe and had him fettered. In those embroidered folds, she struck him down. But others too, as we have seen, had a part in the murderous use of the cloth. <clears throat> in 1984, David Green and I made a new translation of the Aristaya for the production by the Court Theater at the University of Chicago. This, is, by the way, is the translation from which I'm taking my citations. In that production, the director, Nick Ruddle, represented the chain of murder and revenge physically, 
in a literal red thread, more precisely a long narrow red cloth, like the red carpet in a Hollywood premiere, which first appeared early in the first act at line 200, during a scene that was silently enacted while the chorus described the sacrifice of Iphigenia. In this wordless pantomime, like a passion play or a no drama, Iphigenia appeared at the top of a long staircase. And when she was killed, a long narrow piece of red cloth flowed from her fatal wound in the style of the no theater. And that cloth then became the purple carpet of hubris that Clytemnestra lured Agamemnon into stepping upon. And then it became the cloth soaked with Agamemnon's blood and so forth. The same cloth appeared in the hands of the chorus and other characters from time to time as they narrated the scenes in which blood was shed through the use of an embroidered cloth or when a killing was expressed through the metaphor of an entangling cloth or a net. But the idea of extending the cloth back in time to Iphigenia before it was ever mentioned in the text gave a visual dimension to the constant verbal reminders of the blood spilled in a chain of murders, murders that stretch back into the past to Tantalus and Atreus and Thyestes' sons and Iphigenia, long before it entangled Agamemnon. The red thread of vengeance ultimately lodges in the Furies, in their claim of the right to kill Orestes, to shed the blood of men who have shed the blood of their kin, giving a new meaning to the phrase blood relatives, to participate in the chain of male killings, to behave like the male murderers whom they murder. Clytemnestra refers to the work of the Furies as mutual bloodletting. The chorus spells out their role in the deathly chain reaction when it says, the plague of the Furies calls aloud on behalf of those already dead for another destruction to crown the first. We've seen Aegisthus claim to have stitched together Agamemnon's murder, but the human people traditionally in charge of stitching and weaving are not male, but female, as are those supernatural weavers, the Furies and the Norns and the Fates. By contrast, the murders, the murderers that these female weavers ensnare are men. Orestes stands at the end, and here I'm doubling up on what Rainey has said, at the end of a long line of men who have shed blood that the Furies are determined to avenge, avenge ultimately men who kill children and have them eat an inversion of women who give birth to children and feed them. The men in this lineage are also guilty of the parallel crime of killing the unborn young in the womb through the metaphor of the eagles and the mother hare with what David Green called her gravid load of leverets. And Zeus himself, of course, is also known for swallowing his own children. So the Furies as women oppose the lineage of these cannibal men but they oppose them by killing the killers, thus themselves participating in the ongoing chain of murders. Clytemnestra, an apparent exception to the list of human male murderers, figures in the list, I think, because she rules like a man and, as the text tells us, has the mind of a man. And ultimately, in the third play, she is in effect stripped of her role as a woman, as a mother, when it is ruled that women play no part in the birth process, a judgment that inverts the actual natural birth process just as grotesquely as the concept of cooking and eating children instead of birthing and nurturing them. As a murderer, Clytemnestra is playing on the side of the other murderers, the side of the boys and the side of the Furies. The unrelenting, insatiable blood red cloth also suggests another metaphor woven through the trilogy and indeed through Greek mythology and indeed through Indo-European mythology, the idea that the shed blood itself perpetuates further bloodshed. In the libation bearers, the chorus says, it is the law that drops of blood fallen on the ground demand more blood. In the Eumenides, the Furies say to Orestes, 
Your mother's blood shed on the ground must be repaid with your own blood to suck. And Apollo states the other side of the equation. When the dust has snatched to itself the blood of a man once dead, there is no resurrection. The blood of the dead man cannot revive him. As Clytemnestra says, the blood of Agamemnon revived her like the spring rains, but the blood can kill someone else. Hindu mythology expands on this idea in a way that finds a solution to the self-perpetuating murders committed by the Furies, placing in the hands of women the power to end the chain of blood shed by men and by the Furies. Medieval Sanskrit texts tell of a demon named Rakta Bija, blood seed, from every drop of whose blood, or if you prefer semen, a new demon appeared. To conquer him, the goddess Kali opened wide her mouth and drank the blood, as well as the constantly appearing progeny of blood seed that came out of the blood, and then she killed blood seed himself. Thus, the goddess Kali proleptically aborted the birth of offspring of blood seed by prophylactically swallowing his seed, the drops of his blood. This relates to the whole idea of the lineage going on and on and David Shulman's idea of the lineage being stopped. Thus the goddess Kali did this. In other tellings of this story and other texts, the goddess emits multi-forms of herself who extend their tongues to lick up each drop of the semen blood before it can fall to the ground. The long tongue of the goddess Kali is the upward displacement of her excessive vaginas, a grotesque nightmare image of the devouring sexual goddess, her mouth, a second sexual organ. We may recall that the Furies were born from drops of blood shed when Kronos castrates Zeus, but there was no one to lick up that blood but the Furies themselves. The demon blood seed is embodied in the long line of Greek men in the line of Thyestes, from whose spilt blood in each generation another murderer is spawned, even as the Spartans were born of the dragon seed sowed by Cadmus. But the point of the myth of blood seed is that there is no need of an external male agent, a Cadmus, to activate the seed. The blood itself assures that more blood will be shed. The Furies bear a superficial resemblance to this Hindu goddess, but the goddess puts an end to the killings, stopping the blood from doing its inevitable work, while the Furies perpetuate the chain of revenge, shedding further blood, until Athena intervenes to stop them. All the Furies can do is kill the men who have already committed the crimes. They can't break the chain of vengeance because they themselves are an intrinsic part of it. I'm gonna close the door for a minute. My dog is making some noise. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> the third play in the Greek trilogy cuts the thread of self-perpetuating blood shed by human men and avenged by supernatural women, and does this by making everyone male, applauding the change from Phoebe to Phoebus, <clears throat> removing the agency of the mother from the birth process, replacing the female furies with the male Athena and Apollo and the male structures of the court of Athens and so forth. But if everyone is now male, the world is entirely peopled by the very gender that we have seen so prone to grotesque violence. Yesterday, Susan asked, why do they keep coming back to the myth of Atreus? I think it's because as the beginning of the chain of killings, <clears throat> the myth of Atreus is thought to hold the key to the possible ending of the murders. But though Athena's decision cuts off this one particular chain, the chain of Atreus, it does nothing to prevent another chain from arising, another act of male violence that will start a new chain all over again until the male court of Athens intervenes again and so on and so on. 
the court papers over the problems, but does not root them out. The problem is male violence, not female vengeance. In contemplating the Greek imagery of the red cloth that forms a chain of male bloodshed, I was struck by the contrast with the meditation on the chain of male revenge that occurs at the end of the great Sanskrit epic, the Mahabharata, closer to Homer than to Aeschylus, but part of the same world. The Mahabharata, like Greek mythology, like the Aristaya, narrates a chain of violence in which men kill to avenge killings, to avenge killings, and on and on. The Indian gods do not intervene to stop the war on earth. On the contrary, they constantly intervene to keep it going. But in the end, the gods in heaven suggest a way to put an end to the endless killings. In the aftermath of the war, when the heroes from both sides of the conflict, now dead, meet in heaven, the god of war himself, Indra, offers a revolutionary challenge to the warrior ethic on which the entire text is based. Indra and the other gods issue a call to the warriors in heaven to abandon their manyu. That's a Sanskrit word transliterated M-A-N-Y-U, manyu an untranslatable word, somewhat resembling the Greek thumos, that encompasses the concepts of bravado, pride, arrogance, hot temper, aristocratic arrogance, aggressive volatility, warrior pride, machismo, and balls. The English word brook, now seldom used, captures a lot of manu. An aristocratic warrior does not brook insults. More particularly, Manu implies that an insult must be avenged, and so we might translate it as vengeful anger. As Glenn remarked in response to Rainey's paper, male dishonor, or dishonor arises when someone thinks he has done something to me and thinks I won't do anything to him in return. This is the spirit of Manu. The very word for heroism in Sanskrit, vairam, cognate with the English virility, already also signifies hostility, a grudge, a quarrel, a feud. The Mahabharata sees violence as a male problem from the start, all that testosterone. The dead warriors in heaven, first seen in a vision, then met together in heaven at the end of the book, no longer have manu. Heaven is where Manu goes to die. In the text, it is only when the drunken warriors in the Mahabharata are overcome by Manu that they break the rules and set off the chain of events that results in the final slaughter. And only when the incarnate God himself, Krishna, is overcome by Manu does he forget his divine indifference and start killing people. The happy warriors who return on a brief visit from heaven have given up their manu. At the end of his life, reconciled at last with his former enemies, the king, who is the central figure in the text, says there is no manu left in him. And finally, only when Indra urges the king to give up the manu that is keeping him from sharing heaven with his former enemies, and only when the former enemies relinquish their own manu in heaven do they find their final peace. To the extent that manu is the essence of masculinity, it would seem that one of the things that the Mahabharata heroes must slough off along with the rest of the mortal coil is their very masculinity. Manu is what requires a hero to respond to violence with further violence. It is what is responsible for the endless chain of killing. In retrospect, Manu turns out to have been at the heart of the problem of devastating human strife, as well as divine anger. The need for people who have killed one another's sons and fathers and brothers to give up their Manu, to renounce revenge in order to live together in peace and heaven, is this text's answer to a question that continues to plague us to this day, the 
problem of peace and reconciliation, the problem of ending the chain of retributive violence. In this way, the text produces an extraordinary critique of its own social values and of ours. Returning to the Aristia, it's Munyu that keeps the bloodshed going in generation after generation, and short of heaven, the men are going to keep on doing it. The only solution is to let the women, as usual, clean up after them, lick up the drops of blood, but like the goddess Kali, and unlike the Furies, without spilling more blood. The court of Athens is not going to be able to do the job. The final play in the Aristia calls for a change for a new male way of dealing with the problem of self-perpetuating male violence. Presumably, once the court of Athens got rid of all the guys who made other guys eat their own children, they would have a country with nothing but nice people like George Herbert. But this never happened. It never could happen. In conclusion, let me remind you of two of the questions that Susan hoped we would address. Can rational legality tame vengeful passions? Is revenge ever reasonable? I would argue that neither the Aristaya nor the Mahabharata offers a rational or reasonable answer to the problem because the human actors on both sides of the crimes and punishments are neither rational nor reasonable. But I believe that the solution proposed by the Aristaya is more fragile and doomed to failure, though also perhaps more humanly plausible than the solution demanded by the Mahabharata. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for this um, talk, which, uh, yeah, uh, suits very well with Lorraine's, uh, with Lorraine's uh, talk. So um, we have a question from Glenn Most. Wendy, that was um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I have a question based, of course, upon ignorance. Um, are there no vindictive women in Sanskrit <laughs> mythology? Because um, all of your discussion of Manu was so much about these awful men um, and your hope for your, your final remarks about Greece that they should, um, that the problems of, of the house of Atreus would be resolved if the men would stop killing one another, um, made me wonder about Clytemnestra. And that made me wonder about Medea. Medea. Um, and I started wondering about Greek mythology, which is filled with vindictive women. Um, so is this a difference between Sanskrit and Greek um, or how would you explain it? It's a good question. Um, there are some, very few, but some vindictive women in the Mahabharata, in particular, there's one vindictive woman, a woman who is uh, Draupadi, the wife of the five heroines, um, the five heroes, the wife of the five heroes, who is in effect molested or raped in public near the beginning of the play. And whenever the men fail to avenge her mist mistreatment, she says, where is your manu? Why aren't you doing something about this? Where is your manu? So Draupadi is one fierce lady, um, but she is special. She is unusual. It's not, it's not typical of the way of the Sanskrit text mythologizes women. Um, and she's unique. She's also not entirely human. She's born out of the fire. She has no earthly mother. She's, she's very special. <clears throat> so I think the Mahabharata by and large does in fact um, the Mahabharata, I don't know, Indian mythology is a very big thing, but the Mahabharata certainly regards this as a male problem and other women do occasionally try to get the men to stop. Um, so Draupadi is, is, is a Clytemnestra figure, is indeed one tough lady. Um, and she also has five husbands. She's unique in many ways. Um, um, but I think the general picture, picture of the Mahabharata is that this is a male problem, not a female problem. Then uh, Amya, the next one. Hi, I'm going to keep my uh, camera off because my internet connection is so stable and it seems to work better this way. But thank you so much for an absolutely wonderful talk, Wendy. Um, so this is, in a sense, a follow-up question from Glenn. Um, 
So you began um, by speaking about, before you spoke about the Mahabharata in particular, you were talking about um, uh, Rakta Bija and uh, Kali's uh, eventual destruction of him and his whole um, self-spawning army. But the story is, as you know better than I know, goes on from there. Um, Kali goes into a wild frenzy, um, an unstoppable wild frenzy murderous frenzy and Shiva her husband attempts to step in and of course they're very different very many versions of the story but you know one way or another he ends up under Kali's feet um trampled in some versions to death in some versions almost to death and then there's a moment of recognition um but that it seems that story at least seems very seems to paint a very complicated picture about the relationship between the kind of feminine and the masculine impulses and how they relate to questions of vengeance and justice. Yeah. So there we don't seem to have a simple picture of, you know, toxic masculinity, as it were, being uh, brought to a peaceful resolution by the kind of feminine principle, at least something more complicated is going on. And Shiva ultimately is the one who in some sense maybe seems to bring the cycle of violence to an end by taking on a traditionally feminine role of, of pure passivity. So I was wondering how you read that story or the many versions of that story and how it relates to your overall theme. Well, it's, it's, it's another story. Um, um, there are a lot of stories about Kali and there are a lot of stories about Shiva. This is indeed um, one of the modern ones really. It comes much later than the Rakta Bija story, but it's very popular. Um, in contemporary India for sure, and it's the one that most people know. Um, in that story, indeed, the only one who can stop her from her rampage is her husband. And there are a lot of different interpretations of why she sticks out her tongue. One is to lick up everybody's blood. In another, the Bengali version is she says, oh my God, I'm stepping on my husband. Ah! And so she's expressing her female shame at having realizing what she's done and so forth. So the story goes in many different ways. And that certainly is a story in which I wouldn't say that he subdues her, but he triggers her um, self-breaking. She realized I must now stop. There are other stories, of course, in which Shiva himself, uh, many stories in which Shiva himself is primarily responsible for the destruction of the universe when he dances it into, into its disintegration. Kali is also not exactly a suitable role model for most women, um, nor is she taken as such um, uh, among Hindus. Um, Sita, the wife of Shiva, is, is, is more acceptable. Uh, the wife of Rama is, is much more acceptable in different ways. So you're right, Amiya, that I picked out one story to make my point. It happens to be one of my favorite stories. It's, it has a kind of neatness um, that I think is very satisfying. But I wouldn't say that Hindu mythology in general does this. I wouldn't say that Hindu mythology in general does anything. Even limiting myself to the Mahabharata in which Kali does not appear in this form. The one sequence in the Mahabharata that I thought was relevant was this particular sequence which does come at the very end of the book as if to resolve the problem. Um, but it's not written in the same spirit, composed, not even written, as the, as, the, as the myth in which Kali tramples on her husband. That comes centuries later and tells something different. And indeed, even the story of blood, blood seed comes centuries after the Mahabharata. I took the liberty of, of uh, cherry picking um, incidents from the enormous range of Hindu mythology to show other models that resonate with the Arastaya in some ways challenge it that are available, other ways that the Arastaya might have gone, other ways that I felt were in some ways more satisfying than the end of the Arastaya, which I find really very unsatisfying indeed. That's wonderful, thank you so much. Lorraine Destin. Wendy, wow. Uh, I, I was absolutely gobsmacked by your harvest of references to the snares of those cloths. Um, and I realized since you also brought in um, the fates as quite rightly, as weirs, weirs. spinners, etc., that this is a much larger story. And it 
occurs to me that, of course, amongst Athena's many departments of competence, she is herself the weaver. I remember a particularly unfortunate contest with Arachne, which did not end well for Arachne. Arachne. She, becomes a, she becomes a spider. That's She's right, because she who also weaves. It's yeah. very much in parallel, returning to Peter's question, um, yeah. of Apollo and Marcius. I mean, you, you don't want to do something better than the gods. But my question is, given that association with Athena, um, do you think that the purple robes she gives the, the Furies at the end are indeed a trap as well. I'm thinking also of the fact that um, this is not in the Oresteia, but um, Iphigenia, of course, is dressed in um, regal robes for her alleged marriage, impending marriage to Achilles. That's how she's lured to Aulus. Yes. So that they, they, it, there's never a moment where um, basically uh, beautifully woven regal robes don't have um, a treacherous underside. Yes, I'd forgotten that. That's very good. I should I should have put that in. Um, the negative, the, the robes begin earlier, and the idea of the enveloping robes and the color purple and the redness and all of that. I don't know what to make of the fact that Athena is also a weaver. Um, I always thought that Athena was a woman until I read the end of the Aristia. And as a woman, it's made sense to me that she would have um, uh, in charge of woman's work. One can think of Penelope weaving and unweaving and all of the, what, that, what that means in the Odyssey. If you go beyond the Aristia to stories of weaving, it takes you to some very interesting ideas. But weaving also as craftiness and the idea that women aren't as strong as men, but they're more cunning, that the women's work is this kind of trapping. We'll make We'll wave the web, then we'll so forth. It's the idea. It's a rather sexist attitude in some ways of women's intelligence as being tiny and intricate and trapping and so forth. So I think yes, I should have gone back to the robes of Iphigenia, which are actually mentioned in that passage as well as I recall. Um, but I don't know what to say about Athena's uh, role. Um, Ath Athena claims she's not a woman. I mean, in this play, she claims she's not a woman, and therefore. Her, her webs are not women's webs. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me. That part of the Aristotle has always bothered me. It seems to me it's a trick of words. It's not at all a real argument. Uh, this business about women, I know your beloved Aristotle says so too, but they're all just crazy, these guys who say that women have- Aristotle no as far as Apollo does. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I should, however, once I'm attacking Greek, say that as we've often discussed in um, Hindu theory as well as um, found in the Sanskrit law books and indeed in the Mahabharata, the idea of birth is that all that matters is the seed and that a man can sow his seed in any woman, it'll come out the same. The analogy is to agriculture. If you plant barley in this field or in that field, it comes out barley. So too, the paternity of the child, the lineage of the child in Hinduism, as in Aristotle and the end of the Aristaya, is indeed entirely male. The woman just keeps the seed warm for nine months. That's not simply a Greek idiocy. It's also an Indian idiocy. And Aristotle's. Susan. Yeah, so thank you, Wendy, for many things. Um, among them, uh, bringing in the gender question that we've all sort of, you know, circled around. Uh, could I ask you to take off your scholarly hat for a minute and say a word about, okay, you're cherry picking and, and uh, um, I'm fine with cherry picking. I love cherries. And, um, you know, I, I think this is sort of, conference where cherry picking is a fine thing. But um, tell me, what do you think? Is it all testosterone? I didn't know I was wearing a scarlet hat. And if I had one, I would have taken it off long ago. Um, I think it is. I really think it is. Um, as you know, I hang out a lot with dogs and horses. Um, <laughs> um, and it's definitely testosterone um, 
uh, accounts for so much of that behavior when it hasn't been papered over with human speech and all those other things. Um, I think it is basically um, a male problem. I think this idea of honor, um, the idea of revenge, of vengeful honor, what you do to me, I must do back to you, um, is what's at the heart of all of it. Remember, that's why, why your book is so important, Susan. I mean, how do you stop just saying, because this happened in the past, this must now happen in the future? How do you stop it? Um, I'm going to talk I, about that tonight. <laughs> I'm not sure I have an answer, actually, anymore. Uh, but, but it's part of the same problem. It's part of, um, of what uh, Philip Grojevic has written about in, in Africa and so forth, and we were all so aware of. Um, Sudhir Kakar has written about it in India. How, after partition, how did people live in a house next to the house where the people in that house had actually killed their nephew or their son? And yet you go on and you say, do you have any extra rice and may I lend you some cooking oil? How is it that people make that transition? Um, so I, th I think it's the men um, that make the problem. And in some ways, I think it's the women who try to save their children who try to solve the problem. It's true, all these people have died. Let's save the kids and go forward. So I do see it as a gendered problem largely, uh, certainly in the animal kingdom and to the extent that humans are animals in the human kingdom and the, what we've been talking about all these two days is, is it possible to impose reason and law on these animal problems? And as someone who loves animals, I think it's a very thin, papering over and it doesn't go deep enough. It cannot go deep enough to root out the basic, the basic problems. I think it'll always happen.